Have you ever wondered what happens in the deep ocean and what happens to all the animals and sediment there? Well, today we're going to try to answer that question. So where can these zones be located? Well, as you can see from this map, all of the blue areas technically qualify as deep sea marine environments. However, most of the important parts will be a darker blue and are typically around the borders of continents. So what makes something a deep sea depositional environment? Well, it is just that. A deep part of the ocean starting around 200 meters below the sea level, but typically being around 3,000 to 6,000 meters below the sea level. It is found between the continental rise and the mid-ocean ridge. This makes up around 50% of the ocean and covers more than 60% of the planet. These areas typically extend from the continental shelf towards the abyssal zone, and the sedimentary particles found in them may come from terrestrial environments, the hard remains of organisms, or chemical processes in the water. While this area is full of sediments and is smooth in appearance, this is really not the case once you look under all the sediment. Since these areas are formed as a result of seafloor spreading from the nearby ridge, the crust itself is actually quite an uneven area. However, once all the sediment fills in the area as a result of hydrothermal vents or biological sediment in the form of oozes, this muddy layer inevitably creates the flat appearance that we think of when we think of the ocean floor and is one of the most important parts of this depositional environment. There are two main types of sediment, hemiopelagic sediment and pelagic sediment. Hemiopelagic sediment refers to the fine grained sediment that comes from a continent. It consists of at least 25% non-biogenic material and has a few subclassifications. If it is calcareous, there is more than 30% carbonate present. If it is terrigenous, it is more than half weathered remains of land and less than 30% carbonate. And if it's volcanic, more than half of the sediment is volcanic in origin and again, less than 30% is carbonate. Pelagic sediments, on the other hand, are made from the suspended material in the ocean and is comprised of terrigenous dust, clay, silt particles introduced by the wind, volcanic ash, and some airborne particles from fire, which presents itself as carbon. There are also the remains of calcareous organisms such as foraminifiers, coccoliths, the skeletons of radiolaria and diatoms. These sediments collect once above deep, calm water and then settle. Since the terrigenous material is often airborne when it is introduced to the water, it typically comes from deserts or regions with loose sediment. This means that the particles are oxidized by the time they reach the ocean, creating a rusted looking color. Red clays are made from 75 to 90 percent clay material and are rich in iron or manganese. This red clay will lift high and form red mudstone. Now this factor alone is important when it comes to looking at the defining aspects of deep sea ocean environments or facies. Since red is not often a color associated with deep water environments, due to the basin like shape of the ocean floor, the mud, chert, and mud limestone tend to create something resembling concentric rings. With the mud limestone closest to the continental margins, and the mud sediments farthest away. The rate at which the sediment accumulates is very slow at only one to five millimeters every thousand years, which means that it can take up to a million years just to create one meter of sediment. These types of sediment are most commonly biogenic, as you can see from the top left, and the two groups of organisms which commonly make this up are formifera and algae. Once this sediment settles and consolidates, it is often referred to as pelagic limestone. On the right, you can see a map of how sediment settles over time and the most common areas which it settles. Before going too much into the sediments which fill this depositional area, I want to explain the depths where the sediments start to collect and go into solution. These depths are referred to as compensational depths, and there are many different thresholds for different sediments. As you can see on the left, I've highlighted on this diagram about where the CCD or compensational depths would occur. 
Obviously, with temperature and pressure, these can change, but this is typically the range you will find them in. The one I will mostly be referring to from now on is the carbonate composition depth, or CCD. The threshold for this area is around 3,000 to 4,000 meters below sea level, but as I just said, can change based on factors like temperature, pressure, and water movement, as well as how much is already suspended in the solution. The more carbonate present, the deeper it will have to go in order to dissolve. Within this fluctuating range, the amount of carbonate added to the water is equal to the rate at which it dissolves. On the other hand, something like opals, which are formed from skeletons of radiolarins and diatoms, is found much further down at around 6,000 meters plus due to the need for more pressure to dissolve. A sediment which is able to bypass this dissolution either does so by settling on a part of the floor leading down to the, this range, as you can see on the right, or because the water itself is too oversaturated or moving too much. This results in something called oozes. Interestingly, oozes form at a rate of 3 to 55 millimeters per million years, compared to the much slower 1 to 5 millimeters per million years of pelagic sediments. When it comes to oozes, there are two main kinds, this being calcareous oozes and siliconous oozes. Calcareous oozes tend to be found in warmer, shallower parts of the ocean, while siliconous oozes are found in more deep, colder portions. However, do not confuse these oozes with marine snow, as they do contain a lot of the same biogenous sediment from algae in formative area. Marine snow is simply the falling of these organisms, not the collection of them into oozes. Calcareous ooze, as you can see from the light green, is what forms pelagic limestone and is formed from the remains of coccolithophores or foraminifera primarily, which you might recognize as what makes up chalk. Similarly to siliconous ooze, one of these two organisms, coccolithophores, requires sunlight, meaning it is found a lot closer to the surface. While foraminifera do not and are found much lower in the ocean as a result. As you would expect, there is more than one type of calcareous ooze. These include coccolith ooze, foraminifera ooze, a subtype of that called globigaria ooze, and two other ones being petropod ooze and ostropod ooze. Siliconus ooze, on the other hand, is made from the remains of diatoms and radiolarians, which are what forms opal. Diatoms are an abundant microorganism towards the surface, they collect in abundance on the ocean floor once they die. Radiolarians do not require sunlight, but do, because of their symmetry, get the nickname Snowflakes of the Sea. I won't go into all the uses for diatoms in this presentation, but just keep in mind that they are a very useful organism outside of their environment and sedimental uses. As with other sediments, this type of ooze has subdivisions. After the threshold of at least 30% silica secreting organisms, siliconous oozes can become diatomous oozes, radiolarian oozes, and siliconoflagella oozes. While siliconous ooze does come together to form opals, the opal created is often unstable and alters to form what makes up chert. Chert is a fairly distinctive, often black or red rock. The black color comes from the presence of carbon, while the red comes from terrigenous clay. Both of these colors are good indicators of what formed the chert. However, there are other defining factors which help differentiate between types of chert. If radiolaria are present in the rock, it can be seen as fine white spots and causes the chert to be referred to as radiolarian chert. The beds this type of chert forms from are created by the lithification of siliconous oozes deposited in the water. Outside of this, there is also primary and secondary cherts. Primary chert is directly from the seafloor with little to no other sources of sediment. Secondary cherts, on the other hand, are caused by, from when chert is formed by a host sediment, usually a limestone and tend to have an irregular shape. Before I explain the final kind of sediment, that being hydrothermal deposits, 
I just want to give a a brief picture of how closely related the deep sea and hydrothermal areas are on this planet. On the left, you can see a map of all the hydrothermal vents. And on the right, you can see from the darker blue where the deep sea tends to be located on our planet. As you can see, these do overlap quite a bit and definitely play a part in creating this depositional environment. Aside from these biogenous and phylogenous sediments, there is another source of sediment in deep sea environments, as I had just mentioned, hydrothermal deposits. As you might imagine, hydrothermal vents are the sources of these deposits. Hydrothermal deposits are found around hydrothermal vents as a result of minerals being precipitated into the water by the heat produced. The water then cools enough once reaching the seafloor that it precipitates the minerals back out of solution, creating localized deposits around the vents. Black smokers are iron and sulfide rich vents, while white smokers are full of silicates composed of calcium and barium. This collection of sediments often forms something called a nodule, or what is essentially a collection of metals on the ocean floor. So from hydrothermal deposits, we can gather that nodules can be anything from iron to manganese to barium or to calcium. However, there is another deposit that can also result in nodules called hemogenic deposits. These occur in modern rocks as hard, black, rounded nodules, and these deposits include silicates, sulfates, sulfides, and metal oxides, primarily iron and manganese. These metals in the deposit typically form from hydrothermal sources, but can also be the result of continental weathering, including volcanic material. As I stated before, they can turn into nodules given enough time through a chemical and biochemical reactions in the falling bacteria. However, at least for this type of sediment, it's an extremely slow process of only one millimeter per million years. Knowing that nodules exist on the ocean floor and that they are comprised of metals, it is not hard to imagine the desire to harvest these resources. This is something already being explored around the world, and as you can see on the slide, China has mapped out possible locations to harvest their minerals from. Well, this will not happen anytime soon, since there is a lot to learn and understand about these environments surrounding the deposits. It is important to consider that in the future, these areas may be harvested for the resources, and because of that, it is definitely an area which demands more exploration and remains something to keep an eye on.